we are on part two of chapter nine. In this section, we will be discussing storage and file system management on page 414. As you know, a hard disk is a mechanical device used for saving data to. And there is a hard disk in the workstations, but typically users save their data up to the hard disks, which are located on the server. Let's talk about terminology. What's the difference between a disk and a volume and a partition? Now, in this diagram, you really can't see the difference between the two. Now, everybody knows that a disk is a mechanical device. But what's the difference between a disk and a partition? In this case, the partition occupies all of the disk. But if we look at this example, we can see that a partition can occupy part of a disk or all of a disk. A part disk can be divided into two separate partitions. Maybe you would save all your program files on the C drive and all your data files on the D drive and then you could back up the D drive every day. But still, from this example, I can't see the difference between a volume and a partition. The best way to see the difference between a volume and a partition is when you implement disk spanning. Disk spanning is where one logical D drive is stretched across separate partitions. So the volume is the thing that gets the drive letter. A volume might only occupy a single partition, or a volume might be stretched across two partitions on separate hard disks. Now let's discuss the different file systems. If you go to format a new disk, you can format it as NTFS as FAT or FAT32. These are different types of file systems. Old Windows 95 used the FAT file system. FAT stands for File Allocation Table, but the point is it's a file system. And the FAT file system only supported disks of 4 gig in size, which is not very big. And then when they came out with Windows 98, they came up with FAT32, which supports disks which are 32 gig in size. And at the time, that was pretty, gig, pretty big. But, but now, most hard disks are bigger than 32 gig in size. NTFS is a file system which supports much larger partitions. If we turn to page 416, we can see some of the advan advantages of NTFS. One of the big advantages of NTFS is NTFS permissions, meaning you can give different people different permissions to different files. If you're using FAT or FAT32, then everybody has access to all files. But with NTFS, when you format it as an NTFS partition, you can then assign NTFS permissions. NTF supports much larger partitions, whereas on FAT32, the biggest disk size that it supported was only 32 gig. With NTFS, it supports partitions. It supports disks, which are 18 exabytes in size. And an exabyte is a 1 followed by 18 zeros. They don't make hard disks that big, but when they do, Microsoft will be ready. NTFS also supports auditing, determining who looked at which file. NTFS supports encryption, and that protects us in case somebody steals the entire computer with a hard disk on it. And NTFS also supports quotas. Now, you know what NTFS permissions are. NTFS permissions, page 419, is where we can assign different people different permissions to different files. 
In this example here, we don't want just anybody accessing the payroll folder. We only want people who are members of the accountants group. And that way, the accountants group, and only the accountants group, can access the payroll folder. Well, I guess the administrators can access it as well. But average users, we will not assign any permissions to the payroll folder. Now let's look at disk quotas. The disk quotas limit how much space users can use on the file server hard disk. If a user were to copy his entire DVD collection to his home folder on the server, that would fill up the file server hard disk and then nobody else could save any data to it. So what we do is we implement quotas. To establish quotas on the C drive of the server, we go to the server, to the C drive, right click and select properties, and select the quota tab. And then under quotas, we click on the checkbox that says enable quota management and deny disk space to users who are exceeding the quota limit. And then we establish a quota of, for example, 10 gig per user. So each user has a maximum of 10 gig storage space on the server. And the warning level is set to 9 gig. Now let's turn to page 428, Sharing Files and Printers. Well, we already discussed file sharing. With sharing, you've got a server, and you have a folder that you want users to access. So to allow users to access that folder, you share the folder, and then that allows the users to map a network drive to the shared folder. To share a folder, as you know, we go to the server and we select the folder that we want to save. In this case, the name of the folder is data. We select properties. We select the sharing tab. And as indicated on figure 9-25 on page 430, the only thing that you have to do is share a folder is click on this checkbox. After you click on the checkbox, then users can map a drive to the shared folder. And as you know, mapping a network drive means to connect to a shared folder. Now let's turn our attention, page 432, to sharing printers in Windows. This introduces the subject of network printing. But before we discuss network printing, let's discuss non-network printing, which is local printing you could attach a printer to each individual user's workstation. And if you had 10 employees, you'd have to have 10 printers. If you had 100 employees, you would have to have 100 printers. And that would be a pretty expensive way to go. A much more efficient way would be to get one really good printer and allow everybody to print to that one really good printer. So what we do is we set up a file server. A file server is a computer which is attached to the network cabling system and which also has a printer attached. And then the users at the workstation print to the file server. The file server temporarily holds the print jobs and then pushes the print jobs to the printer. That way everybody in the network can print to the same shared printer. To share a printer means to allow users to connect to that printer. So to share a printer, you go to that print server, and you go to Server Manager under Print Services, under Print Management, and you select that printer. You right-click on it. You select Properties. You click on the Sharing tab, and as indicated in Figure 4-26 on page Dash, on figure 9-26, on page 4-33, you can see the only thing you have to do to share a printer is click on that checkbox. That's all you, do, all you do. And then after you share the printer, then that allows users to print to that printer.
you can connect the print server directly to a network printer. Because if the print server is in a locked air conditioned room and the printer is attached directly to the print server, then the user's got to go all the way to the server room to get to the print job. But if you take that printer and you connect it anywhere on the cabling system, if you connect that print server to a network printer, then the network printer is on the cabling system and it's much closer to the users. Now the users still print to the print server, but the print server pushes the job to the network printer, which is much closer to where the users are. That way the users don't have to actually walk up to the print server to get the print job. Now let's turn to page 4 35 and discuss monitoring system reliability and performance. In other words, we're asking the question, is this server being all it can be? Let's look at Event Viewer. Event Viewer allows us to look at events or error messages on the server. To look at Event Viewer, we go to Server Manager under Diagnostics under Event Viewer, and we select Windows Logs. If we look at the system log, we can see any error messages with the operating system. So if you go up to a, a user's workstation and they've been having some sort of a problem, you say to the user, did an error message pop up on the screen? And they say yes. And you say, what was on the error message? The user said, I don't know. I just clicked on OK. If you want to see the error message that pops up on the screen for a workstation or a server, you go into Event Viewer and this shows all the error messages that have occurred on this computer. And if we look at this example, we see some sort of an error message with TCP IP. And if we look at the description, we can see that the system has detected an IP address conflict for address 1.0.0.5 with another computer which has the following MAC address. So this shows us that two computers have the same IP address. This is the, the system log. It shows problems with the computer. Now, if we look at the security log, that shows who logged on, who logged off, and who looked at which files. Whereas the system log tells you what the computer has done, the security log tells you what the users have done. Who has looked at which file? The system log tells you about the computer, and the security log tells you what the users have been doing. Now let's look at Performance Monitor, page 437. Many of you know that if you hit Control-Alt-Delete on a workstation or a server, it will bring up Windows Task Manager. And that will tell you how hard the computer is working. It shows CPU utilization and how much free memory you have. But a more sophisticated software tool would be Performance Monitor. If we go into Server Manager under Diagnostics, we can look at Performance Monitor. Now, Performance Monitor is similar to Task Manager. Task Manager shows you how hard is this computer working. And Performance Monitor also tells you how hard the computer is working, but it gives you much greater detail. For example, we can look at CPU utilization. We can look at disk utilization. Or we can also look at memory utilization. This graph shows that the blue line shows that disk utiliz that memory utilization is about 40%. The processor utilization, the red line, doesn't even hit 40 or 50 percent at most. And the green line disk utilization shows that first there was no disk utilization and then there was lots of disk utilization and then it dropped back off. A bottleneck 
is the thing which is slowing the computer system down. So if the system is slow, then we have to figure out what's the bottleneck. Is the problem RAM or is the problem the microprocessor? So if we look at this system right here, and if we find that this system is slow, why is it slow? Well, it couldn't be slow due to the processor because the processor is not even hitting 45 or 50 percent at max. The prob problem sh certainly isn't a shortage of memory because we're only using 40 percent of memory utilization. The bottleneck in this system is the disk because the disk at certain points is totally maxed out. Another variable that you can measure is network traffic. To measure how much activity is on the network interface card of your server, you can go to Task Manager and select the Networking tab. And that can tell you how much activity is on the network interface card. In this example, you can see that there is none. To measure overall network traffic, you can run a network monitoring program. Microsoft has a program called Network Monitor and it can show you how much is overall network utilization. In this case it's 54 percent. It can show you overall network utilization and then it can show you how much network utilization is being consumed by each individual workstation. In this example two workstations seem to be putting all the traffic on the network and the other workstations are hardly putting any traffic on the network. And another program that you can use is called Wireshark. Wireshark can be used to measure network utilization. In this example we can see network utilization is about 50 percent for most of the time. It jumped to about 80 percent for a while and then it dropped off to just about nothing. Monitoring and optimization. Monitoring means looking, and optimization means taking some sort of an action if there's a problem. So in monitoring and optimization, we have key variables, danger thresholds, and actions. So let's look at those key variables, danger thresholds, and the action that you would take if the danger threshold was reached. The first variable to measure is CPU utilization. And if CPU utilization is at 10%, then don't do anything. But if CPU utilization is greater than 85%, and I don't mean an occasional spike, I mean if it's sitting at greater than 85% all day long, well, that's an overloaded processor. So typically the action that you would take would be to get a faster processor or get a quad core or even an eight core processor or get multiple processors on the motherboard or another thing you could do is get an additional server and take any programs that were overloading the first server and move them to the additional server. Another key variable is free RAM and if free RAM is less than 50 per, than 15 percent that's a danger threshold so what do you do well you install more RAM or you uninstall unnecessary programs that are gobbling up RAM a third variable to look at is how hard is the hard disk working if disk utilization is greater than 85 percent that's considered a danger threshold so you can you can get a faster hard disk or you can implement disk striping. And disk striping is whereby the operating system can write to two hard disks simultaneously, thus increasing disk performance by a factor of two. We will talk more about disk striping later. And a fourth variable to measure is network utilization. If network utilization is greater than 50%, that's considered a danger threshold. You can upgrade the network technology. You could upgrade from 10 base T uh, to 100 base T or upgrade from 100 base T to gigabit Ethernet, or you could divide your network into multiple subnets, and of course that is called subnetting. So if the user 
says to you, this network is really slow. We have to figure out, is the problem the server? Or is the problem too much traffic on the cabling system? To determine that, we bring up network monitor and performance monitor. Network monitor tells us if traffic on the network is particularly high. And performance monitor shows, off, shows us if the server is particularly overburdened. In this example, we can see network utilization is, is kind of high. And if we look on the server, the processor utilization is not that high. But what's really high is the disk utilization. So on this system, if we were to get a faster CPU, that wouldn't do anything to speed up the system. Most likely, we would have to get a faster hard disk. When performing performance monitoring and optimization, monitoring means looking to see how it's doing. And if it's doing fine, don't do anything. But if we find that a danger threshold has been reached, then we perform optimization, and that is taking an action, such as getting a faster CPU, getting more RAM, getting a faster hard disk, or upgrading our network technology. Now let's discuss what's meant by a baseline on page 427. A baseline shows your average utilization over time. This baseline shows that our utilization is gradually going up about 10% per month, 5% per month. So the way things are going, by the time November comes along, we're going to be totally maxed out. So what we do is we order the new servers now, instead of waiting until processor utilization is 99%. A baseline can also be used for comparison. Suppose you tell me that CPU utilization is 60%. Is that a problem? Well, initially you might say no. The danger threshold is 85%. But if we compare it to the baseline, and then we see average utilization for the past several days, weeks, and months has been 20%. And then one day CPU utilization triples. That implies something is wrong. Could be a virus. Could be faulty hardware. A baseline shows utilization over time. It can be used to plan for growth. And it can be used for comparison. Now let's discuss backups on page 443. On the server hard disk, you have operating systems, applications, and data files. And one data file that you would have in most businesses would be the accounts receivable. And if you have had an intro to accounting course, then you know that an accounts receivable is a list of all of your customers and how much money they owe you. And the reason you have an accounts receivable is so at the end of the month, you can contact your customers and, and send them a bill. So if the ceiling comes crashing down and ruins your computer, the cost of a new computer, 500 bucks to 1000 bucks, that's not going to be too painful. That's not going to put you out of business. And you can always reinstall the operating system and reinstall the applications. But if the computer gets trashed and it has all your data files, then you've lost your account rece receivable. If you have lost your accounts receivable, you don't know how much money your customers owe you. You could call the customers on the phone and say, I lost my accounts re receivable. Can you tell me how much money you owe me? And they would say, none. So if you lose your accounts receivable, that can put you out of business. So the most important thing to back up is the data files. A backup is really just copying the data to some other media, such as DVD, or if it's a small backup to a USB drive. You can back up to an external hard drive, or you could even back up to a tape. Now, tapes are not very fast, but they have a lot of capacity. 
A network backup is also called a backup over the wire. And instead of having to go around to each server to do a backup, what you do is you have a separate tape drive, which is connected to what they call a juke box, which is a whole box of tape drives. And you back up from the server hard disk over the wire to the tape drive backups. A backup over the wire saves you the trouble of having to carry a tape drive to each individual server and connect it to that server. But don't do it in the middle of the day. Because if you do it in the middle of the day, all the backup traffic is really going to slow down the users. Typically, you want to schedule the backup to happen during off hours. To schedule the backup, you go to the backup utility and under schedule, you schedule the backup to kick off at midnight, for example, either seven days a week or just Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. A normal backup is where you're backing up all of your data. And an incremental backup only backs up the data which has been modified since the last full backup. So an incremental backup is much faster than a normal backup. And you know what a restore is. A restore is just where you copy the data back to the hard disk, either from the tape drive or from a USB drive, assuming that you have done the backup to a USB drive. A UPS box. A UPS box, UPS stands for uninterruptible power supply, and this is not a computer. This is a UPS box, and it has a big battery in it. It looks like a car battery. The purpose of a USB box is to provide power to the server in case the power goes out. A UPS box provides power to the server in case the power goes out. And this concludes part 